Hey everyone, welcome to BCP Med. In this video, I want to take a look at how to construct a molecular orbital diagram for diatomic molecules. We are going to start off from the basics of hydrogen sigma bonding and work our way up to homonuclear and then heteronuclear diatomic compounds. Let's go ahead and get started. To refresh our memory on the basics of molecular orbitals, let's look at how orbitals can combine to form sigma bonds. For example, if we have two hydrogen 1s orbitals, those can combine in one of two ways. If the wave functions are the same sign, the orbitals will constructively interfere to give a bonding orbital, as shown here, where the electron density is shared between the nuclei. However, if the wave functions are opposite, the orbitals destructively interfere to give an anti-bonding orbital, shown here, where the electron density is on the opposite sides of the atoms away from the center line. The anti-bonding orbital is going to be higher in energy, whereas the bonding orbital is going to be lower in energy. We can represent this in a molecular orbital diagram chart uh, with energy on the y-axis here, whereas the 1s orbitals are combining into a sigma bonding pair and a sigma anti-bonding pair. In this case, the, filling, the, the electrons from the 1s orbital fill the bonding orbital first because there is lower energy and we always fill the lowest energy orbital first. We can also think about how pi bonds form. The p orbitals in carbon atoms can undergo a parallel overlap where they can interact uh, constructively to give the bonding pi orbital shown here. Or they can also interact destructively if the wave function signs uh, are opposite to give the anti-bonding orbital shown here. What would that look like in a molecular orbital diagram? Well, it would be the two carbon atoms and their p orbitals combining to give a pi bonding orbital where the, which will fill in with electrons and then the pi antibonding orbital, which will remain empty, since in this case we only have two electrons filling in. Let's go ahead and jump straight into building the homonuclear diatomic molecule N2. We can go ahead and outline our diagram as follows, and then work step by step to fill it in. Our first step is going to be to go ahead and fill out what the valence orbital structure looks like for each of the nitrogen atoms, which will be as follows. Each nitrogen will have a filled 2s orbital and a half-filled uh, p sublevel with one electron in each of the p orbitals, x, y, and z, respectively. Now, for our first step, we want to go ahead and combine molecular orbitals of like energies into bonding and antibonding pairs. That is the name of the game for molecular orbital theory. To start off with, let's go ahead and combine the 2s orbitals on each nitrogen. The s orbitals will combine into a sigma and a sigma star molecular orbital. Then the electrons from the s orbitals will start to fill in those molecular orbitals. Because there are four electrons in the original atomic orbitals, and there are four available spots in these molecular orbitals, they will fill in both the bottom bonding orbital and the anti-bonding orbital as well. Now, in addition to the s orbitals, we also have the sets of three p orbitals to work with. Geometrically, one set of p orbitals can end over end overlap to combine into a sigma bond, whereas the other two sets of parallel p orbitals will combine into pi bonds. So what is that going to look like in the diagram? Well, the end over end overlap is going to give us a sigma p and a sigma p star in the diagram. Pretty straightforward. Now, the overlap of the parallel p orbitals is going to give us two pi bonding orbitals and two pi antibonding orbitals, right? Orbitals have to be conserved, so if we put in two sets of p orbitals on each side, that's four, and that's going to give us two and two for a total of four molecular orbitals as well. We can then go ahead and start filling in those, p or those uh, pi bonding orbitals and sigma bonding orbitals in energy from lowest to highest. So in this case, we will fill in the pi p orbitals first with our six electrons. So we're, those are going to get four. They're going to be completely filled since we have six to work with. And then the remaining two are going to go into the sigma p. As a result, this uh, molecule is going to look something like this if we look at a uh, three-dimensional space filling picture. We're going to have the sigma bond associated with the p orbitals down the middle, and then the two pi bonds associated with the p orbitals uh, in the x and y plane, you can imagine, perhaps, or the y and z plane, whichever you would like to describe it as, uh, which are perpendicular to one another. Now, 
what would the bond order look like, right? We know from Lewis structures that we would expect a triple bond between N uh, and the N2 molecule. And indeed, the bond order calculation for a molecular orbital is to take the number of bonding electrons minus the number of antibonding electrons and divide it by two. So in this case, we have eight bonding electrons, the sigma s, the two sigma p's, the two, uh, the sigma p and the two pi p's to give us eight bonding electrons minus the sigma s star, which is going to be two electrons. So that's going to be eight minus two is six divided by two gives us three, which is the exact bond order that you expect based on the Lewis structure for N2. So in this case, the Vesepr and the molecular orbital theories agree nicely on the character of the N2 bond being a triple bond. We can now go ahead and do the exact same thing for oxygen, O2. Again, we start by laying out our diagram and putting in the atomic orbitals. In this case, oxygen has one more electron than nitrogen in its P sublevel. We can then, pretty straightforward, go ahead and combine our two S orbitals into sigma star and sigma bonding orbitals, just like we did for nitrogen, and then fill those up. Once again, the two S orbitals are going to fill the, both the bonding and anti-bonding pair and are eventually going to cancel each other out. Once again, we're left with three p orbitals to play with, and we're going to have the same one sigma and two pi interactions based on the geometry of the p orbitals. Except one thing is going to be different, and this is very important. The sigma bonding uh, pairs for the oxygen p orbitals are going to look as follows, and are going to fill with the uh, electrons first. It turns out that the pi bonds for O2 are actually higher in energy than the sigma bonds. Why that's the case, we'll talk about in the next slide. Just take it with a grain of salt right now that for O2, this is what the orbital picture looks like. And it will look like that for F2 as well. But we already put in our two uh, electrons into the sigma P, and now we need to fill in the rest of the electrons into the remaining orbitals. So oxygen each has six P electrons, I apologize, each oxygen has four P electrons to give a total of eight P electrons. We just filled in two, so we need to fill in six more. We give two and two into the remaining pi P bonding orbital, but that leaves us with two electrons. And now we need to start filling the pi anti-bonding orbital. Based on Hund's rule, we need to go ahead and fill each orbital before pairing up the electrons. So each of the, of the pi p anti-bonding orbitals is going to get one unpaired electron. And this is going to lead to some interesting effects, which we'll talk about in a second. But first, let's go ahead and calculate the bond order for the oxygen. So this is the complete molecular orbital diagram for O2. And if we go ahead and calculate the bond order, we take the number of bonding electrons and subtract the number of anti-bonding electrons. That's going to be a total of two, four, six, eight bonding electrons minus two, four anti-bonding electrons. So eight minus four gives us four divided by two is two. So for molecular orbital theory, we would predict a bond order of two for the oxygen molecule, which is not surprising since we know O2 has a double bond. Now, those anti-bonding electrons in the uh, pi star orbital lead to some interesting effects. And that is because those unpaired electrons, uh, I'm going to get back to the energy crossover in a second here, but the unpaired electrons in O2 mean that it should be paramagnetic. Unpaired electrons lead to paramagnetism, which means that O2 will be attracted to a magnetic field. This is not predicted by Vesepr theory, as the O2 Lewis dot structure shown here does not have any unpaired electrons. But experimentally, this is observed. O2 is paramagnetic. In fact, liquid oxygen is so paramagnetic, you can pour it in front of a giant horseshoe magnet and watch the stream bend towards the poles of the magnet. This gives strong credence to molecular orbital theory. Now, to come back for a second towards the energy crossover here of the sigma and pi bonds, this is important. And we're going to go ahead and spend the next slide on why the pi and sigma bonds switch as compared to N2. So why does this flip-flop happen with the energies of the orbitals? Why is it the case that in the oxygen, we are have the pi orbital higher in energy than we have it in the nitrogen? Why does it, from the left diagram to the right diagram, why do these orbitals switch? The answer is both subtle and complex. It turns out that when the effective nuclear charge is lower, 
as it is in nitrogen compared to oxygen, the s and p orbitals are closer in energy. As a result, the sigma s and the sigma p orbitals, which arise from combinations of s orbitals and p orbitals respectively, are also closer in energy, and they can start to mix somewhat with one another, since they have similar symmetries, similar geometries, that is. Right? So sigma p and sigma s are close enough to start combining, and as a result, the uh, energies of the orbitals start to change. Right? The mixing of the sigma p and sigma s decreases the energy of the sigma s orbital, but raises the energy of the sigma p orbital. In fact, it raises it so much, it raises it above the pi orbitals. And so in nitrogen, which has a lower nuclear charge, we're going to have more mixing and therefore a higher energy sigma p, which is going to be above the pi orbitals. However, in oxygen, with a greater effective nuclear charge, the S and P orbitals start to break apart, and we have less mixing, meaning that the sigma P will be lower in energy, and it'll drop below the pi orbitals. So in this case, it's not actually the pi orbitals that are flip-flopping, it's the sigma P orbitals, which are moving back and forth depending on how much they are mixing with the sigma S orbitals. It's a really interesting phenomenon. At this point, we're ready to tackle a bit tougher of a challenge. Let's go ahead and build a molecular orbital diagram for carbon monoxide. Like usual, we're going to go ahead and set up our outline for the diagram and insert our uh, atomic orbitals under the corresponding atom. One thing you will notice right off the bat, though, is that the oxygen and carbon orbitals are not at the same energy. This is because oxygen has a higher Z effective, so its orbitals are proportionally going to be slightly lower in energy than those of the corresponding orbitals in the carbon. However, because they're both period two elements, they're still relatively similar. Uh, this will lead to some interesting discussion later on with larger gaps in energy. But like usual, we can go ahead and start off by combining the two S orbitals, which are similar in energy, to get a sigma S and a sigma S star, and then we fill those in with the uh, necessary electrons. Now, we can start to combine the P orbitals, and so we first combine the P orbitals into our sigma P and sigma P star, and then we can go ahead and fill in the sigma P star with two electrons. Now the question is, are we going to go ahead and put the, P, the pi orbitals above or below the sigma p? Well, it turns out that this is going to follow a nitrogen-like configuration. These, the pi orbitals are going to be lower in energy than the sigma p orbitals. The reason for this is that the, it turns out that um, the energy gap between carbon and oxygen leads to more mixing similar to how a lower z effective works. So this is going to look like a nitrogen orbital picture. Uh, some people have described this um, by the following uh, sort of thought process. You can look at a heteronuclear uh, molecular orbital diagram as being the average of the two effective nuclear charges. So carbon is going to be a plus four and oxygen is a plus six. So that ends up averaging to plus five, which is the same as nitrogen. Um, that's not strictly true speaking from a uh, quantum mechanical perspective or a physical perspective, but in this case, it works to explain the phenomenon. So take that with a grain of salt. But uh, anyway, we can go ahead and start filling in the rest of our electrons, and they fill in to the pi p, two electrons in each orbital, and that's it, right? Oxygen contributes four p electrons, carbon two, that gives us a total of six, and we fill in those electrons nicely into the bonding orbitals. Nothing else needs to go into the antibonding orbitals. So, as I noted earlier, right, to explain the uh, positioning of these orbitals, we uh, attribute that to the fact that uneven energies mean more mixing, which will lead to sigma above pi like N2. And to calculate the overall bond order, we're going to do the same thing we always do, bonding minus antibonding over 2, which is going to be 8 bonding electrons minus the 2 antibonding electrons in the sigma S, to give us an overall bond order of 3, which matches very nicely with the Lewis dot structure for carbon monoxide, which is indeed a triple bond. Finally, let's go ahead and look at a more difficult example, hydrogen fluoride. As usual, we begin by setting up our outline and inserting the atomic orbitals. Immediately though, we'll notice that there's a difference compared to what we've seen before. The orbital energies of hydrogen and fluorine are wildly different. 
the 1s hydrogen orbital is somewhat above the fluorine 2p orbital in terms of energy, and it's nowhere near the fluorine 2s orbitals. Orbitals can only combine with other orbitals of comparable energy, which in this case would be the hydrogen 1s and the fluorine 2p. However, only one bonding interaction can be made, and it must be a sigma bond, since the s orbitals cannot make pi bonds at all. So the hydrogen 1s will go ahead and combine with one of the fluorine 2p's to give a sigma and a sigma star orbitals, where the two atomic electrons that are unpaired will fill the bonding orbital. Right? So we can only form one bond with this hydrogen 1s orbital, which means we're going to have some leftover uh, orbitals with fluorine. Right? Three of the f orbitals will be non-bonding, or not participating at all, in the uh, molecular orbital. In fact, they're really not doing anything. These orbitals uh, are going to remain at the same energy that they were before in the atomic orbitals of the isolated fluorine atom. And they are going to be represented in the diagram by these one-sided lines. Right? Uh, the lines indicate that they come from the fluorine, but do not participate with anything of the hydrogen. There's no connection to the hydrogen orbitals. Right? So these have an analog in the Vesepper theory, and that is that these lone pairs, these non-bonding orbitals, which only correspond to fluorine, are analogous to the Lewis lone pairs shown on the structure here. Those three lone pairs on the F atom correspond to the three non-bonding orbitals in the molecular orbital diagram. Now, it's important to note there is not always a direct parallel between the two theories, and lone pairs in Lewis dot theory do not correspond to molecular uh, orbital non-bonding pairs. For example, when we looked at oxygen, we saw a bunch of lone pairs on the O2 molecule, but those have nothing to do with the uh, unpaired pi, anti, uh, pi star electrons in the molecular orbital, right? Those are two completely different things. One theory predicts paramagnetism, the other doesn't. They're not the same. However, the one overlap that is true is that non-bonding orbitals that remain at the same atomic orbital energy are localized to that one atom. They're not participating in the molecular orbital, and so they behave just like the separate theory. They act like lone pairs. And with that, we've actually reached the end of the content for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching, and if you enjoy what you saw, please like and subscribe to the channel. Make sure to check out our other videos in the chemistry playlist to learn more, and if you're looking to branch out, check out our other science playlist as well. See you next time.